Welcome back to Dielectric Videos. It has been a long time since I've done a video in general, but it's also been a long time since I've done a video about the 36 horse engine from my wintertime videos that I posted about rebuilding this engine. It should already be evident from the thumbnail that there's been a lot of changes to this motor and some pretty cool modifications done to it, so I'm really excited to get into it and tell you what I've done. So I'd like to first talk about one of the most exciting modifications that I've done to this engine that could actually be applicable to just about any VW air-cooled engine that you need a little bit more electric power from. What I have done is mounted an AC Delco style 150 amp V-belt driven alternator to the exhaust pipe and exhaust header on the side of the head using a couple of Simpson strong tie brackets. It's belt driven. It doesn't require you to remove the original alternator or generator in this case. It allows you to continue using the generator as a through shaft for the fan, but it gives you the massive power at the extremely low prices, relatively speaking, of the modern Delco style alternators. This is a really cool mod in my opinion, and I'm really excited to show you a bit more about how I implemented it. On one side of this alternator, I've basically just taken a piece of 90 degree Simpson strong tie bracket and I've just welded it straight to the surface of the exhaust pipe. Admittedly, the welds are not very great, but I put this thing through 46 miles or more of brutal off-road, on-road, dynamic driving conditions and have not had it come loose. The belt has maintained its tension within reason and the whole thing has just done exactly what I need it to. Looking at the other side of the alternator, I've taken a second strong tie bracket, basically a 90 degree bracket used in framing, and I've basically drilled a hole in one corner and a hole in the other corner, ground off a little extra material so it would fit, and used it to affix this side of the alternator to the bolt or the stud coming out of the head where the exhaust pipe mounts up on the head. Now I think this is a particularly elegant solution in that it allows you to put a similar type of alternator on virtually any VW engine you want. And it's really cool in my opinion because since the exhaust pipe comes off basically as two pieces and there's just a couple of bolts holding it on here, this can be moved from engine to engine. If I want to put a big alternator on my 1600 or if I build a 1776 engine, I can do that with almost no major modifications apart from installing this bazooka exhaust pipe. On the Engine Revival Series Part 4, a commenter named Capitan Camote Picante said those twin pipes destroy horsepower. And that is actually quite true in that because they don't promote scavenging from the exhaust system, basically they don't take the pulses of exhaust flowing out from one cylinder and use them to augment the withdrawal of the secondary pulses from the other cylinder, they're not particularly effective at increasing the removal of exhaust gases from the combustion chambers. That being said though, another commenter, Cameron Thomas said, he has the same twin pipes and is also building a Manx buggy in his front yard. Not only that, but with a 36 horse engine as well, which I think is super cool. So there's a bit of mixed reviews on whether these are good or bad. Say what you will about them, they worked phenomenally well for my project because I was able to easily modify this particular one to hold the alternator in place and I wasn't too worried about damaging it since these are relatively inexpensive and still widely available exhaust pipes. You can probably also get clones of them that are manufactured in the modern day as well, which means you're not destroying some relic in, from history when you're modifying it to put an alternator or other accessory device on here. So for my project, which is really not a high performance engine, this is just for fun to build something out of scrap parts in the yard. These are absolutely perfect and they work great so far. One upgrade that I ended up doing was I bought a set of four new cylinders for this engine. Now initially I was planning on just making this video series as, you know, something to do with some scrap parts and just to see if I could get it to barely run. I expected it to basically blow itself up after, you know, a few miles of driving. Well, what ended up happening was the cylinder number three started burning a tremendously bad amount of oil, just huge amounts of oil smoke coming out of it. And I ended up actually unplugging the spark plug from it altogether to prevent it from generating huge amounts of pollution. That actually worked reasonably well. It stopped smoking and it remained quite drivable on three cylinders, uh, but of course it was really rough and wasn't giving a lot of power, but the thing that was important was it kept going and going and going and it lasted a really long time, nothing broke, and I realized this might actually be a drivable, at least backup engine, if not a main engine for driving around. 
So I decided to, you know, invest the 230-ish dollars that it costs for a new set of uh, 36 horse cylinders from eBay. I got the cheapest set I could find that was still new, which really is, you know, I, again, I'm not planning on building a crazy high mileage engine, but when I put those things on, the thing just took off. The power was phenomenal. So much better than with those original cylinders that really were poorly honed to begin with. And I additionally, since I had all four, just had great power, it was very smooth, and it's been running really well since. So I was very happy with that. It basically brings my total cost to build this to around $500, which for a vintage engine like this is really not that bad, especially if it is drivable and gives you a good amount of power like this one does. So very good investment. If you're having problems with oil burning and you have low compression, it might just be worth that $200 to get a new set, especially when they include the cylinders, the rings, and the pistons with everything already honed and broken in, ready to drive. While we're talking about putting new cylinders on and all the benefits that it afforded for this thing, I actually had to go do my yearly emissions testing, and I went ahead and did emissions testing with this 36 horse engine that I built from scrap parts, and it passed. I couldn't believe it. I honestly thought it would probably fail because I had the carburetor restrictor and, you know, old parts. The valve guides are a little bit leaky too, but it still managed to get well under the limits for hydrocarbons and probably about half the maximum on the carbon monoxide levels. So really a pretty wide margin of safety on that emissions testing. It was doing very well and that's a great sign because it means it's not necessarily causing as much damage to the environment as I would have thought and it's legal to drive even with this engine on it. So this is absolutely awesome and I was very happy about that. So let's talk about carburation. This is a Solex carburetor designed for use in a dual carb system on a larger displacement engine. It's not designed for single carb use, but it has worked really quite well. The barrel size is too large really for this engine, so what I've done is I've added some restriction to it by putting this 90 degree bend on it and adding a reducing fitting inside the PVC pipe that takes the intake around down to around one inch in diameter. You might think that reducing the intake is a really bad idea because you're restricting airflow, but for an overcarbed system, it really works nicely. Again, like I said, it passed emissions, which means it's not running overly rich. There's no smoke coming out from over, you know, too much fuel being dumped in, and it is the smoothest ride you can imagine. When you hit the gas, there's virtually no lag spot. It picks right up off and goes, and honestly, this is the smoothest carbureted engine I've ever driven. Basically, whenever I've driven carbureted cars, I've always felt that you kind of have to feather the throttle a little bit, you know, finesse it a little bit to get it to accelerate smoothly. This one, you can plant your foot on the ground and it will give you the power. It's really quite cool. I was very impressed with how this worked and I'm gonna keep it just like it is. This is a good system. It matches the engine well and everything seems to be working nicely. So enough talking about it, let's go ahead and give it a crank. Now this is going to be a cold start. I haven't had it started in a few days, so it probably is going to have a little bit of a hard time starting. But what you'll see is once it gets up to temp and idles, it's really quite smooth. So I'll just go ahead and give it a few pumps so it's got some fresh gas to start up because that alternator will bog it down quite a bit when it's trying to recharge the battery. But since it's got a little extra fuel, that'll make it, you know, give it nice, uh, a nice kick start while it starts up initially. So I'll go ahead and get it cranked. So it started right up pretty well on a pretty cold start. Uh, it wasn't super responsive on the throttle when it was still cold, but I've let it warm up a little bit, so I'll show you how it runs once it's warm when I hit that throttle. Now, if you ask me, that is some very responsive throttle response on this carbureted system. Usually, there's always a bit of lag when you're first opening that throttle valve. In this thing, when you give it power, it just goes. It's absolutely awesome. If you're wondering about what kind of fuel I run in this, I'm actually able to run standard 87 octane pump gas here. No need for special octane additives or premium fuel in this system. The compression is not super high on it. It's high enough to give lots of power, but there's very little pinging or detonation, even under very heavy load. This thing pulls out of like a 
sub 1000 RPM lug in third gear like it's nothing. I mean, it pulls out of it like it's a diesel engine. Very, very good performance on the low end. Not, no detonation as far as I can tell, and it just moves power. So 87 gas has been working great. That's what I'm running. And I'm hoping to be able to test some alternative fuels in this at some point, for example, E85, or maybe even hydrogen. So that'll be a cool project in the future if I get around to it. Before I show you some quantitative testing of the performance of the alternator, I'll just cut in some footage to see it driving off-road and around town so you can see what kind of performance I get out of the system. So now that you've gotten to see some footage of me driving the vehicle, I want to talk a little bit about the charging system. Now I designed this to be able to stand in as a fully capable power generating station for any mobile application. This is a full size uh, marine grade or RV grade group 24 DC battery. It's a 12 volt battery, but it's designed for deep cycling. It's not a true deep cycle battery. It still needs to be kept near top charge most of the time, but it is a very capable battery that will withstand deep cycling without permanent damage. So a lead acid battery will charge any time the voltage is over about 13.6 volts. Ideally, you want the voltage around 14.4 volts for fastest charging. So let's take a look at what this battery's voltage looks like when the engine is idling and there's no load on it. As you saw there, it's idling and running at about 14.7 volts. Nice aggressive charging voltage for a lead acid battery. The deep cycle batteries are robust. They can withstand that fairly high charging voltage and it will make sure the battery gets a full charge very easily and I shouldn't have to worry too much about it running dead due to uh, slow charging or poor alternator performance. Now, if I run for very long periods of time, it's going to be a good idea for me to have a good battery electrolyte checking uh, schedule since this is a vented electrolyte battery. At that high charging voltage, the hydrogen and oxygen in the water get broken off into H2 and O2 gas, which can then vent out the top of the battery, leading to depletion of the electrolyte over time. So periodically, I will want to be checking that acid level to make sure that there's sufficient water in the battery and adding some distilled water to the cell as needed. So I've gone ahead and connected a 1500 watt power inverter to the battery. We'll start the engine up and then hook up a load and that'll tell us how much current this thing is using when we put the clamp meter to it and we can also check the voltage to ensure that the battery is still charging. So let's go ahead and do that. I've connected a roughly 750 watt space heater, which I found is roughly the largest load I can put on the system at idle without the belt starting to get a little bit slippy, but we'll try this out and see how it performs with the inverter running. I'll go right ahead and start the engine and then we can start this up and do some tests. 
Now, before I start up the space heater, I am going to increase the idle setting of the engine substantially. The reason being that this alternator requires a fair bit of speed to get its full current out, and when I first measured the voltage, it was not able to maintain that 13 and a half volt minimum to keep the battery charging when the heater was running. So I'll just go right ahead and crank up that idle. So now we've got a nice fast idle that'll keep that alternator happily supplied with rotational power while we're cranking up the load. It's that easy. A few turns of the screw on this carburetor increases the idle without even needing to mess with mixtures or bypass. It basically just pushes the butterfly valve a little bit further open and gives you more throttle. So there you go, we were easily maintaining 13.8 volts, which is more than enough to keep the battery happy and charged while powering this space heater. We were drawing 59 amps from the inverter, and we were actually still charging the battery from the last time I cranked the starter, with an inbound current of actually 61 amps to the battery from the alternator. Granted, we're not pushing it all the way up to the 150 amps, and we can try going a little harder than just one heater, but what we will see is the belt may start to slip if we go too hard. That being said though, this is a phenomenal amount of power. You could run just about any basic outdoor DJ event or whatever you wanted with this, and it really is just a very general purpose power source. Not, not a lot of concern about overloading the alternator. The belt will slip before the alternator overloads, so you'll know about it. And that battery, which is a big deep cycle, will still withstand lots and lots of discharging if, for example, you manage to damage the alternator through heavy use in a field environment. You'd probably still be able to drive all the way home without a problem. All right, I know you guys wanna see it, so we're gonna go all the way to the top with a full high-powered space heater and a 500 watt lamp. I already tried this. We were able to keep the voltage just above 13 volts and it draws over 100 amps at the inverter. So I had to crank the idle way up, basically near the red line to get this thing to power it, but it actually does power it. So let's try it out. I'm gonna start the engine first, then I'll turn on the 500 watt, then I'll turn on the heater and we'll take a couple of measurements.
So there you have it. We just ran over a kilowatt of power off of this engine using only the onboard alternator that I installed and the inverter. Pretty cool, right? So I'll go ahead and tame the idle back down before this thing blows. So I'll go start it up again and then we'll back off that control screw. Thanks for watching this update video on my air-cooled VW project. I look forward to seeing you in the next video. See you next time.